Hello, Steve Stricker, RTC TV4, and today we are at Peterson Wagoner and Perkins, and I am talking with Andy Perkins. And uh, Andy, what do you want to talk about here today? Well, I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, land contracts. Um, they go by a, a different names. Usually when people talk about a land contract, what they're essentially talking about is, is a seller-financed sale of a property. That is, if, if I wanted to buy property from you, Steve, and I, uh, uh, for whatever reason, sit down and you and I reach an agreement where rather than borrowing money from a bank, uh, I'm uh, going to pay you over time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's generally an installment contract um, and a lot of people find those useful uh, either in situations where um, I want to save costs or situations where uh, uh, I have other credit extended uh, 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 other areas and, and maybe uh, some people go into land contract because they're not ready to get approved for a, a bank loan yet. Um, sometimes there are arrangements uh, among family, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they don't want to put a house out on the market, and so sometimes they reach the, the land contract agreement. The, the key aspects of an agreement like that uh, are always make sure, because often it, the, the lawyer enters the picture after the buyer and seller have, have come to some terms, and uh, always make sure a couple things. Number one, you know what property you're buying. Now that sounds self-explanatory and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, usually inside the limits of a town or a city uh, what you thought the property was you were selling to me is probably the same as what I thought I was buying. But it's easy particularly uh, when you get out in the country but uh, uh, even in town sometimes it's easy for me to assume that uh, maybe this this 30 feet on the west side of the house goes with your house when in fact you know not all of it does and so land contracts are are a good tool for that but it's always important to start say what property is it familiarize yourself with with the property uh, it may be appropriate to get a survey if it hasn't been done in a while so everyone's on the same page uh, a lot more uh, Litigation and conflict arises from misunderstanding mm -hmm. uh, uh, than fraud. And so that's step one. Step two is uh, what are the, the payment terms going to be? Uh, what is the total purchase price? Will it be paid over a period of three years, five years, or ten years? Uh, will there be a requirement that after you know, 36 months I have to go to a bank and try and get conventional financing? Mm -hmm. Most people who are contract sellers, in my example, that's you, most people who are contract sellers aren't interested in doing that for 20 years. Right. You know? And um, uh, uh, some other important aspects in our, our agreement could be, what limitations do I have as a contract buyer? And here's where I think a lot of people get tripped up. Um, rather than think of themselves as selling a property, or thinking of themselves as kind of the bank financing the sale of a mm -hmm. property. Both of those are, are uh, comparable in some ways. They tend to take it from a landlord point of view, often because they have the experience of being a landlord. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've seen some people uh, try and draft their own land sale contracts, and you could tell that rather than take the model of a, of a mortgage, mm -hmm. which I think is a closer model, they actually take the model of a, uh, a lease agreement. And for example, if you and I were enter in, entering into a land sale contract for the purchase of, of a house, it would be abnormal for you to tell me I can't have pets. Mm -hmm. It would be a little out of the order. It's not impossible for you to do that, but at some point we have to ask the question, well, why wouldn't I have pets? Uh, am I not going to own the property? And then it's important conceptually to uh, uh, make sure those limitations are tied to the purchase price. That is, as a landlord, it's perfectly understandable you might want to restrict uh, the size of my pets mm -hmm. because you're going to want to continue to preserve the value of that property long after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. But if you're selling it to me, in theory, Every day, I, every month I make a new payment to you, I'm closer to owning 100% of the property. Right. And so 
uh, you're you're ultimately restricting what I can do with my own property in a sense. And so uh, uh, that's not 100% true because what if I don't successfully buy the property and you take it back? In that sense, you are protecting yourself. And what if I've only purchased 7% of the property, you know, uh, that you could also say, well, if 93% of the equity in the property is still yours, then you ought to be able to restrict the pets. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that's a blanket, yes or no, but people designing these agreements need to think their way through that. So uh, what restrictions am I going to put on the, are you going to put on the property that I'm buying as I'm in the process of buying it? Uh, along with that is, when will I get the deed and how will I get the deed? The simplest of land sale contracts says, when I make the final payment to you, you hand me the deed. Mm -hmm. you, know? uh, you can design those other ways. We can place the deed in escrow so that uh, when I give an affidavit or some other uh, document to the escrow agent the escrow that says I've made the final payment, the escrow agent gives me the deed um, that you've already signed. Uh, so there are different protections you can put in there. Um, one that's gotten litigated quite a bit in Indiana is the issue of what happens if I default? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, There uh, was a, uh, a case in the 1970s in Indiana that famously dealt with that very issue. And in, in, in that case, the, uh, the sellers had paid uh, uh, a high enough percentage of the total purchase price that the court felt it was not fair, essentially, for the seller to come in and say, well, yeah, I know you paid a lot of this purchase price, but you missed a payment, so we're taking it back as we would an eviction. Mm. Um, and so uh, courts in Indiana uh, have have said, look, there comes a point, and there's no, I won't say there's a magic number, but there comes a point when if I've purchased enough of it, you can't just kick me out. You have to foreclose on me like a bank would, mm. okay? And the, the distinction, sometimes lawyers talk in the distinction of foreclosing versus a forfeiture. A forfeiture, we kind of act like the contract didn't mm -hmm. exist and we, we go back to the way things were. Um, and so every seller would love to be able to just do the forfeiture. And every buyer would love to say to the seller, now you got to foreclose on me. You have to recognize my, my rights. And what that means is if, if it goes belly up, I don't pay you. Uh, y you want to keep it as simple as possible. And uh, I want to protect if I've paid some equity and it goes to sheriff sale. Um, and you shouldn't get a windfall from that. I should get some of my equity back. And so mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the struggles that people need to have the meeting in the minds of. They need to talk those out. Um, and uh, uh, for most people, if they come in and see me and they want a land contract, you know, they've done a pretty good job of talking their way through purchase price mm -hmm. uh, uh, and sometimes the restrictions. They haven't thought, uh, uh, sometimes they haven't thought a lot about, uh, um, well, what, what, what happens if? And a lot of my job is answering those what if questions and trying to make sure that the that agreement is not just uh, um, legally enough, but it tries to anticipate some what ifs, make sure the parties have a full kind of meeting of the minds mm -hmm. so that they're less likely to run into any trouble down the road. Seems like uh, if everybody knows exactly what's on the table, uh, it's usually ends up a lot better for them. Absolutely. It's, it's always, that's true of contracts generally. Uh, it, it's always helpful to just go through the whole arrangement one more time, ask what if, uh, see if there's anything you hadn't thought your way through. Mm -hmm. uh, because when, when breach of contract cases happen, they usually happen uh, as a result of something that no one talked about. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, hey, well, well no one thought of this. Right. And you can't no contract can account for you know 100% uh, of those what ifs, mm -hmm. but the more you work your way through, uh, and that's part of what part of what we try and do is is bring our experience to bear on those questions and have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And um, uh, but before anyone enters into a, a land sale contract, you know there are some things they they need to to understand, um, and uh, that's kind of where we come in. Yeah. Well, awesome. I had some questions running through my mind, but you must have been in there because uh, everything that I was thinking of, you were answering as we were going along. So uh, great information on uh, land contracts for, uh, you know, 
make sure everybody's on the same page is Absolutely. the big thing. Yeah. So. Thanks, Steve. Well, Andy, thank you very much. All right. I appreciate your thank time. You. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can give Andy a call here at Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins. Mm -hmm.